I'm here today with Kate and David Rademacher. Kate's professional work is focused on international public health, but Kate is also the author of two memoirs, Following the Red Bird, First Steps into a Life of Faith, and a new book called Their Faces Shown, A Foster Parent's Lessons on Loving and Letting Go. Their Faces Shown is being released tomorrow, so we're really quite thrilled to be able to do this uh, interview as part of uh, Kate's uh, book launch program. Um, the publishing house is Light Messages Publishing, and so many congratulations to the new for the new book, Kate. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> so we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, I also want to mention that Kate is currently working on her third book, Reclaiming Rest, The Promise of Sabbath, Solitude, and Stillness in a Restless World, which we published by Broadleaf Books in mid-2021. So we're going to be looking forward to that one as well. David's husband, excuse me, Kate's husband, David, is a psychologist who's been in private practice for over 30 years. He's also been a practicing Buddhist for over 35 years and has been teaching Buddhism for about 10 years. So um, this is obviously a really interesting, you know, a conversation to have. Typically, I do interviews with authors, but uh, it's wonderful to be able to do an interview with both a husband and wife partners. So, um, Kate, you, in your book, in Face of Show, you describe your experience as foster parents, but in addition, the book is also a lot about the dynamic between the two of you and marriage. So, given this, uh, we thought it'd be great to be able to talk with both of you. So, thanks for agreeing to do this. And uh, maybe, Kate, you can start by giving us an overview of the book and perhaps talk about some of the differences that you and David had experienced uh, through the journey of navigating um, the, the, the foster experience. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And um, I want to thank David for being a good sport and joining us today. This is our very first couple interview. So uh, <laughs> we were joking before the before the um, call that maybe it'll be more turned into more of like a therapy session. Dave is a therapist, so you can be our you can be our therapist friend. Um, but it's great to be here uh, talking about the book. I have the advanced reader copy here. As you said, it comes out tomorrow, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, so it's a memoir about our journey as foster parents. And um, Part of why I wanted to invite David to join us is that as I've been talking with people about the book and um, sort of getting ready to have it launch into the world, you know, certainly the book is about our experience, the particular journey we had as a, the foster parents of a two-year-old and then she turned three years old while she was with us, um, our experience being her foster parents. Um, but more broadly, as you mentioned, Brian, the book is really about a lot about our marriage and a lot about um, kind of some of the challenges and um, growth we experience as a couple. So that's why I wanted to put David on the spot and, and hear what he has to think about the book too. Um, <laughs> and just briefly, just so you know a little bit more about David's and my background, um, David, as you mentioned, is a Buddhist, long-time Buddhist. Um, I uh, grew up Unitarian Universalist, and I actually converted to um, to Christianity. I didn't identify as a Christian, um, and I became a Christian in my early 30s and was baptized in my early 30s, and I'm now part of the Episcopalian Church, um, and the Episcopal Church, and so we have an interfaith marriage, which has been a big part of our dynamic, um, and I write about that in my first book, Following the Red Bird. I have a copy of that, too. Um, so there's the first book, which came out in 2017. Um, but the bigger issue that kind of drives the, the story, the narrative, and the experience in their faces shown is that David's older than me. He doesn't look it, perhaps, but he's about 16 years older than I am. And um, David had my um, a, a son from his first marriage, my stepson Soren, and then we had a daughter together, our daughter Lila, who's now 14. Um, and after Lila was born, I really, 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 really wanted to have another child. And um, David, who had been at that point parenting for nearly 20 years, because Soren is now 25, just didn't, didn't want to have another kid. And I, I'm not sharing anything that's secret because I write about this and we talk about it really openly. Um, so it just created a real kind of crisis for us, or just a long, maybe, maybe crisis is the wrong word. It created a long, slow, simmering challenge for us. Um, and neither of us were... You know, we were both loving, we're both good people, we both are, I would say, skillful. I don't know if you agree, you know, we, our communication was always kind and, and thoughtful, but we just, 
we were at an impasse. Um, and so we decided through a long process of deliberation and what I would call discernment, given my um, spiritual orientation, we decided to become foster parents. And that then was a long journey. We have to I don't know, we have to get we had to get licensed as foster parents, we had to do home visits, we had to go to this long class. Um, we had to be interviewed by the social workers, and then we had our, then it took a while for them to place, about, about a year for them to place a child with us, and then um, then we had the, our foster daughter was placed with us. Um, and so the book is really about the discernment, like that whole, the part one is really about sort of deciding whether to foster, because we really, at least, I don't know, David, if you felt that way, I think we were aware that foster fostering has a lot of risks, can, can come with a lot of risks. It can come with very tangible risks, but it can also come with emotional risks, right? Because what if you fall in love? I mean, what I hear most frequently is, I admire, you know, I admire that you did it, but I could never do it because if I had, if I fell in love with a child and then had to let them go, um, I don't know how I could handle that heartbreak. And so that really becomes one of the themes in the book also is as the subtitle says, loving and letting go. Um, so, and then, and then again, the kind of journey in our, in our marriage together through that process. So that's kind of an overview. And again, thanks David for being a good sport <laughs> in every way. <laughs> well, it's, again, it sounds very fascinating. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to, to seeing the book. Um, as you mentioned, one of the other kind of, you know, factors in your, in your marriage is the fact that you, each practice different faith traditions. Um, and, and actually, you know, several of the author partners who I work with, um, you know, are in those kinds of situations too. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about how that affects um, your marriage, your, uh, you know, Kate's um, book writing and, and your respective careers. You wanna take that question? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I mean, it's been a richness in our lives. I think mostly a richness. It hasn't been conflictual, right? I wouldn't say conflictual at all. Um, so I think our dynamic has changed over the years where I think when Kate was first uh, entering Christianity, I had to keep my mouth a little bit shut on about Buddhism because I can be a little, I can be a little overbearing, a little lectury because I'm a teacher. So I like to teach and stuff like that. It can be a little overwhelming. So I sort of learned to stop doing that and listen to her more. And I think it's an richness. I think I am benefited from it. I hope she's benefited from it. And we both have a strong commitment to our traditions. So I think they're synergistically positive, actually. It's a good thing. I think we tried to do um, sort of joint services for a while. We haven't really been able to follow through very well that where we go to like the church one day and then we go to the Buddha Center right after that, but we haven't been able to keep that up very well. But it's it's been good. Yeah. I mean, I would just add also, I think David has been an incredible like inspiration for me. I think one of your author partners, Dana Trent, also writes about this in her memoir, which is I think there's a assumption that interfaith marriages could like weaken somebody's faith, but I think David has just an incredibly rich practice and rich, deep belief and is incredibly thoughtful and intelligent about his um, faith and his, and his practices. And so that's really provided inspiration for me. And I would say like when we first got together, when I was more of a searcher, kind of a spiritual seeker, David was maybe secretly hoping I would become a Buddhist, but I really, I just really felt called in a different direction. But I think as soon as that became clear, you were always just really on board with supporting me. So I think ultimately, and again, I really appreciate that Dana Trent, Trent writes about this in her first book, um, Saffron Cross, which is having a partner who is deeply committed to spiritual practice, whatever it is, really creates a sense of like inspiration and container and momentum, I think, for the other partner. Whereas even if you, if you had a partner, I think, who was kind of like lukewarm or different about their spiritual practice, but was like the same faith as you, that's less, I think, helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, indifference, you know, is uh, not valuable, whereas, uh, you know, insight is. So, <laughs> right. yeah. 
And I think it challenges both of us to sort of say, well, what does the Christian faith say about this? What does Buddhism say about this? And we have a lot of rich dialogues about that, as you can imagine. So. Well, it seems like neither one of you are terribly Christian. And one of the <laughs> issues that I can imagine in, in an interfaith marriage has to do with the children, right? And, you know, where are they, you know, affiliated or, you know, who do they listen to or not listen to? You know, all these kinds of questions. So how have you navigated that? Well, I mean, I think in the beginning, there was a little bit of pressure on Kate's side to get Lila baptized, and I was not comfortable with that. And um, I think we just decided to let Lila make her own way in the world, just like we've made our own way. I mean, I came to Buddhism in my 20s. She came to Christianity in her 30s, and Lila can come to whenever she wants. She's well-versed in both traditions. She understands she can talk your ear off about emptiness or any Buddhist <laughs> concept and Christian concepts. So she's really pretty intelligently connected to both our traditions. So she'll find her own way, I think. Yeah, when she was maybe four or five, she said to me, Mom, do you think I'm more of a Christian Buddhist or a Buddhist Christian? Um, <laughs> so I think that sort of captures it well. And I mean, again, I think one of the things that we role model more than an ideology is like that we're both passionately engaged in our faith traditions and deeply in love with our religious communities and deeply in love with, um, again, with the paths that we're on. So I think in some ways we're role modeling to her what it means to live a faithful life. And I hope that that's the most, one of the most important gifts we can give her. And again, that she feels known and loved, I think, and held in both of our communities, both at my church and at David Sangha. People see her, they know her, they love her. And again, I think that's one of the biggest gifts any kid can have in a faith community. That's my opinion. Yeah. I think also we emphasize more practice than ideology in some ways. So it doesn't really matter so much. So the practice overlap is pretty big in Christianity and Buddhism in some ways. And so that's really what's important anyway. That's cool. That's good. That's an interesting perspective, and I think pretty useful for your situation. So. Yeah. So back to kind of the fostering aspect of that, you know, when you first started considering that, um, what were some of the issues that you had to navigate in considering um, whether or not to do that? I mean, one thing very practically is, I'll, I'll let you speak to this too, David, but David is a self-employed psychologist and, um, you know, there are very real risks for our family to become a foster parent. We have, we have acquaintances, friends who, um, there was a child in their home who um, falsely accused them of abuse, and then, you know, that triggered a whole legal response um, among the social workers and the lawyers, and it was very painful for them, but, but it was emotionally painful for us. You know, David's livelihood, you know, is dependent on his professional reputation, and so those, that risk really weighed on me heavily and the risk, as I mentioned earlier, of falling in love with a child. And we had an explicit agreement at the beginning, given, again, that David was older and didn't feel like he wanted to sort of sign up for, you know, a lifelong commitment of parenting. We had signed up for the track to, to just foster. And so we knew, or I knew going in that there was a strong risk that I'm such a, you know, I'm a person who like falls in love easily and deeply that my heart would be at risk, which is what happened. And there was, you know, as my memoir described, there was heartache involved. And, um, but I think ultimately if we feel like it was worth it, you know, it was a, it was a rich, loving, joy-filled journey for all of us that was also really, really hard. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think we conceptualized it initially as like, you know, we're gonna have somebody at our table for a while. That's a wonderful thing to be able to give. You know, I can have somebody at the table for up to a year, right? But it's like the the twenty year vision was too much for me. So, so that's sure. I no, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm at the stage of being a grandparent right now. You know, which um, is really fun once your kids are off on their own, right? And the second incarnation of having small children around is so much more fun because you know you don't have a level of responsibility. They go home. You, know, you, you play with them and then they go home and so that's a wonderful thing yeah, yeah i was just thinking of I, when you it's right before you said that i was thinking about that as sort of the grandparent i mean and of course the challenges with a lot of foster kids is that when they leave your house you don't know if they're going to be safe and healthy and um 
you know, so there, again, that was a, that was a risk to like fall in love with a kid who you then are sending back out into the world who may really be not in an ideal situation is, is painful for everybody, of course. Um, and we knew it probably would be for us. Um, so. Well, you know, <laughs> when we sent our daughters off on their own, we didn't know where they were going to end up either. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I know it's not the same. I'm not trying to minimize that, but, uh, but every, every parent, I think, shares at least some level of uh, angst. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I think, again, fostering care feels so sort of different in that way. But I think you make a point. It's like the, the, the journey of loving and then letting your child go, you know, it's obviously much different with foster grand, fostering, which is, and as you say, very, very different, lots of huge challenges. But um, there is a kind of universal spiritual I think journey of, of loving and letting go. That's what life is, right? So. So Kate, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, kind of the whole tension of self-promotion um, in you know, marketing uh, books uh, versus, you know, the approach of viewing all of this, as how to help people. Yeah. And then build awareness on how, you know, your books can help them. So in this specific instance, you know, as you've been launching this book, how has that been looking and, and, and turning out for you? Yeah, well, I'm really just kind of at the beginning steps of kind of getting the word out about this book. And, you know, I think that's, I think, you know, so Brian, you and I have talked a lot about how do you make marketing a book more fun? And I think, you know, I mean, it's fun to be here with David. This is the first time we've done this together. And I just thought, you know, as you and I were planning for this interview, I'm like, this this would be this would be fun and sweet. So I think bringing some, you know, like asking myself, well, what would be fun and meaningful, um, rather than just like doing kind of what I think I should be doing to market a book. So um, that's that's kind of something I'm bringing to this to sort of launching the second book that I didn't bring to the first book. Um, so that's one thing. And then I think you know we also. There's, I've, you know, as part of my launch, I'm working with a couple of nonprofit organizations that work with families who are impacted by chronic poverty and violence. And so as I do book events, I'm hoping to plan um, some joint kind of friend raiser or slash fundraisers for these nonprofits. Because again, as you say, it's, it's about, you know, I hope that my book will be um, useful to to readers and be, and also I think it's just a sort of compelling story. So I think it's, it's kind of a quick and engaging read. I'm hoping it's not like a, it's, it's, there are a lot of emotional topics, but I think it's also a pretty gripping story, but also I really, you know, want to use my book to help kids and families who are impacted by chronic violence and poverty. And so to be able to also um, elevate and amplify some of the work that nonprofits are doing. We're working with one local nonprofit, one national nonprofit, and one international nonprofit. Um, so that feels really good to, to sort of be partnering with those, um, those organizations as part of the book launch. Excellent. I think that's wonderful. I mean, and, and talk about, you know, ways to expand, you know, the reach of people that you can help, you know, through your work. So that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. So, um, Maybe you could both talk about this next question about um, advice for spouse involvement, you know, <laughs> for authors who are writing personal memoir on touchy subjects. <laughs> yeah, good one. It's good to not be too defensive, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't pay attention to much of the detail of the writing of the book, so I just let it happen. I'm like, oh, I'm sort of surprised when I see the draft. It's like, oh, that's good. And, you know, I don't know. She's fair. You're a fair person. <laughs> so I guess another way to word the question is how do you maintain your sanity, you know, uh, <laughs> or, or sense of humor in the midst of uh, all of this? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you do have a good sense of humor. That's a helpful thing, I have to say. It's good to have a lot of patience. That's a good thing to do. <laughs> patience is really a good virtue. I pray about patience quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's been a lot, you know, I'm working full, as Brian, as you know, I work full time and I've, I've been kind of writing these books as a side hustle, partly, sorry, because I feel really called to it, but David's been really patient and generous and, um, yeah. 
patient with, and generous with the time that it's involved and um, patient and generous with letting us tell our story. So I'm grateful. Yeah, well, the story is like the, the um, I mean, after the tragedy of loss, I think the, the least I could do is let her write a book about it. <laughs> so, you know, since I'm responsible partially for her not getting what she wants and it seems fair. Yeah, so this is our, this is the baby that I, that he, that he, this is like the surrogate baby, yeah, is which is, baby. I mean, it's, it's, a, I'm sort of being tongue in cheek, but it really, it does, I, I mean, I, I think, I think it does sort of feel like that. I mean, I, I think writers often talk about how their books feel like babies, and I think. Yes, absolutely. So much of our journey has been tied up with this question of, like, our, our family, and so in some ways these books, you know, this is our book baby. <laughs> Birthing a baby, birthing a book, you know, there, there are definitely, definitely analogies there. Kate is really a hard worker, and she was a hard worker before I had foster children, and I was concerned about how she'd have the energy to foster and do the things she had to do, you know. So that was one of my concerns, and so when we, when we didn't end up keeping this foster child, who's a really great kid, by the way, just a super-duper great kid, she launched into having another baby with the book anyway, right? So we've been just as busy probably... <laughs> As you would have been no matter what. So, it's well, you know, I mean, productive people are productive people, right? Exactly. And, exactly. You know, they apply their productivity in different directions. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, very useful, helpful directions, which I, I highly trust that Kate always will do. But, um, but I, I can totally believe that, um, you know, it's been daunting at times because, you know, Kate, you, you do a lot of work in your day job. <laughs> You're very busy there, I know, very committed to that. And you've written three books, basically, in a period of five years, you know, which is pretty productive there. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'd be curious if your other authors feel this way, Brian, but I think also... You know, being an author is not a linear journey. You know, there's no cookie cutter. It's like, where are you going to publish? How are you going to publish? Are you really writing a book in the first place? Is it, you know, meant to be a book versus this? So I think it's just a really, it's a, it's a process that takes a lot of um, discernment. And I would say, you know, that's another theme that um, I really explore in the book is discerning the next call. How is, call, how is God calling you forward on kind of the next step on your journey. And, and that's, I would say, another place where I would say that we did have some, I would say, difference. Again, I felt the difference in our marriage because, again, as a Christian, I really had this sense of vocation and discernment that, like, where is the Holy Spirit calling me next? Kind of, you know, I may not, and I, I may not be able to see 10 miles forward, but I, part of my job as a Christian is discerning, like, the next step forward. But I think David doesn't understand discernment or vocation. Like, those words aren't those words don't appear in the Buddhist lexicon. So I think, you know, he said to me at one point, which I relay in the book, I'm like, you know, I just feel like this is my calling about foster care. And he's like, I'm not on that conference call. You know, that's, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not dialed in on that one. So I think that's, you know, even just having different frameworks really did, you know, all of that is challenging, was challenging for us to navigate, but we did it. High five. <laughs> well, congratulations on, mul on multiple fronts and um, we'll have to Kate you know pick up on that topic of discernment again I think yeah. soon so uh, yeah that'd be great because I think it's a really interesting one absolutely absolutely so maybe um, to finish up would you like to read an excerpt uh, from the book so that we can all hear a piece of it yeah, sure do you, okay um yeah, so maybe I'll read to you from chapter two, um, or chapter three, rather. So this is, has the sound. Is that good? So this is right after we had started the foster care class, and um, there was, we had gone to the first week, and there was actually a really nice group of people who were doing the foster care, so you have to be licensed as foster families. And so this was the second meeting of the class. Um, so the chapter is called... Chapter 3, Sliver. On the second meeting of the class, the size of the group had shrunk by a third. Sheila, the nurse, was gone. The truck driver and his homeschooling wife were gone. Christine was still there, and I sat beside her with a grateful smile. I was glad we were in this together, at least for now. I was glad for all of the familiar faces. The lesbian couple, Anna and Sylvie, were back. 
Jane and Simon, a sweet couple who owned a restaurant downtown, were there. Jane's face perpetually seemed to have the appearance of a startled rabbit, eyes wide and searching. I had wondered if she would return. Stuart, a heavyset man in his 50s who had asked a series of perceptive questions the week before, cracked a few jokes as the group settled in. We all laughed and chatted companionably with our neighbors. We were like old friends. But as the evening progressed, the anxiety level in the group creeped up palpably. We received profiles of kids in the system, JC, Brian, Carla, each situation more horrible than the one before. Stuart started shifting in his seat uncomfortably. Jane with her rabbit eyes began blinking rapidly. My own heart rate accelerating, I dropped my eyes and started flipping through the pages of my manual nervously. Fetal alcohol syndrome, attachment disorders, medically fragile children. The material on the pages did nothing to calm me down. I kept flipping. Maybe the next chapter would have something more reassuring and uplifting, like what to do when you get placed with a well-adjusted child who just can't seem to stop thanking you for all the ways you've touched their life. <laughs> David was quiet. Aside from the social workers, he was the only one in the room who really knew what we were getting ourselves into. As part of his psychology practice, he conducts forensic evaluations for the courts. He assesses, he assesses sex offenders, advising whether treatment might help and predicting the likelihood that they will reoffend. He carries out parenting evaluations to assess the mental health needs and competency of parents who have been neglectful. And he provides therapy to kids who have been abused and are in the system. After a few years of listening to client stories over the dinner table, I had to ask him to stop sharing the details. It was traumatizing me. I couldn't stop imagining the face of the 17-year-old kid whose father had beat him until he was almost unconscious when he had been caught fondling his younger sister. The father had dragged him into the police station until the kid confessed under oath. The judge, eager to be seen as tough on crime, had tried the 17-year-old as an adult and he'd gotten 15 years in jail. David said the kid had a soft, round face and blinked with tears in his eyes when he was in David's office for the evaluation. The kid was a victim of sexual abuse himself. David was laying low in the foster care class. He didn't want anyone to know that he was an expert. He was concerned that the social workers would target our family to receive the toughest cases. <laughs> it seems like it will be a therapeutic project, David said flatly over dinner the next night when I asked him how he thought the class was going. I know how to do therapy. I'm not sure I particularly want to do it in this context, but I know how. I became animated. You don't have to see it like that, you know. Sure, it wouldn't be the same as parenting our own kids, but you don't have to be cold and clinical about it. It will be in our home. It, will, it won't be doing, like doing therapy. It has the possibility of doing something different, something full of love. I pause, the last sentence coming out quietly, something that could even be transformative for us. David shrugged noncommittally. I launched into my typical defensive monologue. David, I just feel like this is a calling. I just feel it. Don't you understand? Yes, I do. But it's just that I'm not on this conference line. They didn't dial me in on this one. This is your call, not mine. His words came out quietly but firmly. So why are you going along and doing this? My breath cut out about Charlie. For you, it's your dream. I'm doing this so that you can scratch this itch and get the thing you want so badly. Wow, how cool. <laughs> well, it's really wonderful you guys have been able to share all of this, you know, publicly and, you know, and, and also, you know, congratulations for making it through in one piece. <laughs> yeah. But doesn't that make you feel stronger as a couple? You know, when you're able to f dive into something that's pretty challenging and make it through it. Yeah, I, yeah. I think so. Do you feel like yeah, I think we're strong. Yeah. It was definitely really hard. I mean, I think we, we don't want to really, Honestly, we had a really good kid. We, had, we ended up with a really easy kid in some ways. You know, so it was not traumatic in that respect. It was traumatic in terms of loss for, for, for us and for mostly for you. Yeah. But it was really a wonderful experience. The kid was beautiful and sweet, and we loved her, and she loved us. It was really wonderful. So I want to say that, too. We really just have been so blessed. And everything goes pretty well in our lives, actually. It's... Another example of how things have really worked out for us. I mean, I don't know why we deserve this. We just did really, we lucked out. So. Yeah, so she was a great kid, and it was just really hard to let her go, just as people predict. But, again, that's, that was what we signed up for. And so it was, it was definitely a loss. But I think sort of the takeaway is loving and losing are kind of worth it. You know, it's better, <laughs> what do they say, better to love than never lose and never to have loved at all. I mean, I think that's, that's true for us. So. Yeah. 
Very cool. Well, congratulations again on the book and, uh, you know, the, the process of getting to that point. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned and look forward to the, uh, the third book next year too, Kate. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about that one. Broadleaf Books has been great to work with. So really looking forward to working with them on getting this book out about Sabbath and rest, because as you can imagine, as you, we were talking about, I'm quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> this. And so I've really been um, intentionally kind of embracing a Sabbath practice and so excited to be um, writing about that and sharing about that next too. So. Well, you only be tired for a couple of days and then you'll be productive again. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, we're better than I thought. My God, it's so true. <laughs> That's because we're both similar in, <laughs> in some, of these, some of these aspects. So I, I know the phenomenon well. <laughs> in any event, well, thanks so much, you guys, for spending time with us. And good luck on the rest of the launch. And uh, we will continue to support uh, you in whatever ways we can. Great. And Brian, I can maybe just before we wrap up, I'm going to probably be doing a book giveaway um, on my website in the next month. It's not launched yet, but people can visit me at katerodemacher.com so, um, for more information about that. And, um, and again, just really want to thank Writing for Your Life and Compassionate Christianity, both for the incredible support you give to your authors and just love both communities so much. So really appreciate, Brian, all you do. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kate. It's, it's just nothing more than a pleasure to be able to work with people like you. So, uh, <laughs> it makes it a lot of fun. Yeah. But uh, please let me know when you do the uh, giveaway announcement okay. so that I can get the word out about that too. Great. Thanks, Brian. And All right. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.